It's with great joy that we teach start chapter 3 of Perkei Avos. Uh, we're going to read this Mishnah, and we're going to dig into it. A very powerful teaching from Akavya ben Mehalalel, Akavya the son of Mehalalel. And interestingly, we're going to be going back in time. Akavya lived at the end of the Second Temple era, whereas the sages that we've discussed uh, previously, the end of the second chapter, they were all really, they, they reigned after the temple was destroyed. This is going back to a little bit before it was destroyed. Um, so he's in that like kind of the, the first generation preceding the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Akavya ben Mahalalel Omer, Akavya the son of Mahalalel says, Histakel varim, Look, consider, visualize, examine three themes, and you will not come into the grips of sin. What are these three things you should look at? Know from where you came to where you're going and before whom you are destined to give an accounting and a reckoning. What are these three things? Where did you come from? From where did you come from? From a putrid drop. And to where are you are, you are going? To a place of dust, worms, and maggots. And before whom you're going to give an accounting and a reckoning. Before the Almighty, King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed is He. This is a very astonishing, provocative statement. All you need to do is to examine, is to look at three things, and you're guaranteed to never sin. If you know where you came from, you know where you're going to, and you know before whom you're going to give an accounting and a reckoning before uh, before the Almighty. If you know these three themes, we have a guarantee from Akavya and Mahalalel that you won't sin. So this is a very astonishing statement. And I want to kind of get into the just the the claim and what it what it means, you know, because if you understand why this will stop you from sinning, you all, will also understand why, if you don't look at this, why you may indeed sin. Uh, but uh, Akavya ben Mahalalel, he is someone, we don't really know a lot about him because there's not many episodes that were told about him. There's one major confrontation that he had with the rest of the sages that were told about in the book of Idios. Uh, it tells us that he had four opinions, four positions in opposition to the rest of the sages, and he wasn't willing to recant his positions. And the sages told him, I said, Akavya, you're one of the greatest sages in the world, but there's four laws that you're not willing to accept the ruling of the majority of the sages. If you retract, if you recant your positions, we will nominate you to be the Av Bezdin, to be the head of the Sanhedrin. You will be the greatest rabbi in the land. Just relent on these four rulings that you're not willing to give in. And he responded with a very striking statement, which may have a lot of overlap with his teaching in the Mishnah. He said, it's better for me to be considered a fool every day of my life but to not be a wicked one for a second before God. I don't want people to say the reason why he retracted his position in Torah was so that he could have a position of prominence amongst the nation. So essentially, he was offered this incredible opportunity. Don't be a stickler for what you are espousing, these four laws that you're not willing to give in to the rest of the nation. and will make you the greatest sage in the land will give you the highest position. He said, no, I'm not willing to forfeit my principles and be considered a wicked one before God for even a second, even if it means that I'll be a fool for my whole my whole life. And the Mishnah has a disagreement as to what happened afterwards. According to some opinions, they dis- excommunicated him. According to others, no, God forbid, he was never excommunicated. How could you possibly excommunicate him when he was the greatest sage of the time. And the episode ends that when he died, when he was about to die, he was on his deathbed, he told his children that you, my children, should recant these four positions after I pass. 
And they said to him, well, if you're telling us to recant these positions, why don't you recant them? And he responded, well, I heard these teachings from my teachers. And these teachers, like that was the normative position. And therefore, I have to stand by what I heard. But now, I'm the lone sage that believes these four halachos to be true. And therefore, you, you're hearing it just from me in opposition to the to, to the majority of the sages. And therefore, for you, for me, it was a different calculation. I heard it from the majority. And therefore, I have to stand by it. You heard it from me, from the minority. And therefore, for you, for you it's appropriate to recant. And finally, the children said, okay, well, why don't you commend us in front of your colleagues? He responded, no, I cannot commend you. I cannot write you a letter of recommendation because, and he ends with this great line, your actions will bring you close and your actions will distance you. Meaning don't rely on the fact that your father is the greatest sage of the land. That's not going to help you. It's only you. Your destiny is in your own hands. Your actions will determine how great you become and what kind of standing you earn and what kind of distance you will have, God forbid, if your actions lead you in that path. So, of course, the commentaries find many, many overlapping themes between this major episode that we're told by Kavit Mahalel and his teaching that is enshrined in Perke Avos. So what does he tell us? He tells us that there's three things. If you look at those three things, you won't sin. When someone dwells on the shameful origins of his body, that he came from a putrid drop, the primordial biological matter that makes up, or that's the origin of all bodies, number one. Number two, the temporality of life here as a person is currently constituted. The fact that the ultimate destiny of our body is that it will die. There's no one that has been able to stay alive in a body. Soul, sure. Body, no. Well, what happens to the body? You bury it. Well, what happens to the body once you bury it? What's the destiny of the body? It's going to be munched upon in the dust by the worms and maggots. That's not a great legacy. And finally, our soul, our true essence, is going to have to have a confrontation with the Almighty. And of course, that's that's terrifying. Because we're going to have to defend our position against God. And if we dwell on these things, we're not going to sin, says the copy of Mahalalel. Just as a side note, in many Jewish funerals, there's a custom to read this Mishnah at the funeral procession. Again, the reason why is because at a funeral, we're encountering a lot of this idea that he's saying, the idea that we're temporary. The idea that we think we're invincible, maybe we, we, we delude ourselves to be thinking that we're invincible, but then we come to a confrontation with a certain reality that reminds us that we're temporary. And we take, we have a, a, one of our friends maybe that we're burying them. And therefore it's a powerful time to revisit these themes of Akavi ben Mahalalel. And therefore there is a custom to read this Mishnah during a funeral procession. Now, this idea is found elsewhere in the Talmud. The Talmud in the book of Brachos, page 5a, we have mentioned this before in the past, the Talmud tells us that there's four tactics that a person could use to overcome the Yetzirah, overcome the evil inclination. And one of those four, the final one of those four is Yazkir lo yom hamisa, remember the day of death. Again, the same kind of idea that we see here by Akavi ben Mahalalel uh, to remember the fact that the ultimate destiny of our body is that it's going to die. That will help us avoid sin. So the question that I want to kind of, the, the general question that I want to probe here is why exactly is this prescription against sin, like why exactly does focusing on these three things, why will that prevent us from sinning? And by extension, we could interpolate why we would sin if we ignore those three things. So I think the takeaway that we have from this Mishnah is, and this is a theme that we're going to see now much more often throughout the rest of the Perkei is that there's a, an essential conflict 
that is undergirding the life that we have. And the Torah tells us, it's a Mishnah later on, chapter 4, uh, that our ultimate objective, it's one of the found foundational principles of, of Jewish faith, our ultimate objective is, is our soul and the destiny of our soul. That's our true identity. That part of us is permanent. That part of us is eternal. And that part of us lives even after our body stops living. That's a foundational element of Jewish philosophy. Now, Jewish eschatology, the idea of reward and punishment, is about what we call olam haba, the next world, this world of the soul. What happens to the soul after it leaves the body? The soul is like a foreigner in our world. It's forced to be married, to be fused with the body, but it exists in a different world, in the world of the souls, after it is freed from the tentacles of bodily constriction. And it lives in the spiritual world. And because that is our essence, that's our, our identity, that's our true self, that's our eternal self, therefore the real consequences of life are manifested in, in that world. Thus, in essence, the conflict, the, 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 the foundational conflict that we have in our lives, what Torah is trying to encourage us is to try to optimize for the soul, to do actions that are more beneficial for the soul, whereas the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, the idea of sin is to optimize for life as a body. So therefore, the, 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 the test, the tension is, are you going to live in a way that's going to prioritize the spiritual world and prioritize the soul, or are you going to live in a way that's prioritized the physical world and prioritize the body? In essence, a sin, by definition, is a choice to optimize this world as an ultimate goal, and to optimize the body in lieu, in lieu of the soul. That's what we say is a sin. And a mitzvah is to optimize for all above, for the spiritual world, and for what's better for the soul. The Yitzhah is the force that tells us, this is the world you've got. This is, you have a body, this is who you are. This is me. Now, even though biology tells us this is not you, because if you are the same person you were yesterday, your body has billions of cells that haven't existed yesterday, and there's billions of cells that won't exist tomorrow. So it's really, it's, it's really untrue. It's really a logical fallacy that the Yetzirah is telling you that your body is your essence. Your body is always changing. Your soul really is your essence. But the actual deception of the Yetzirah, the miscalculation of sin, lies in a lack of recognition of basic facts. And the lack of recognition of basic facts is what Akavya Mahalel is reminding us over here. Number one, that if you think that your essence is your body, then you very have a very low self-esteem. Because where did that come from? It comes from a very shameful place. And where is it going to? Also a very shameful place. And in addition, there is, again, inherent in that idea is that there's a fixed shelf life. That you have a beginning as a body, you have an end as a body. It's fixed. It's limited. And the de day of death will come for everybody. Every body. Not for everybody, but for everybody. And what the Yitzhahara, what he is able to do is to make us ignore that fact. If we just conveniently don't think about that, if we just ignore that, only then, only in that world can he make his argument. Can he say, you know what? Prioritize the physical world over the spiritual world. However, once we realize that we will die and therefore we essentially are realizing that our essence is our soul and that's permanent, everything else is temporary, once we kind of actually confront that, Everything that he was proposing, everything that the evil creation was proposing, everything that it was proposing, crumbles because it has no basis now. It's no let's stand. It's a house of cards. It, it, it is, it's crazy for someone to prioritize the temporary and ignore the permanent. I've given an example before. You know, if some people have braces, they want to straighten their teeth. But I've never in my life seen a kid with baby teeth putting on braces. It's never happened. 
Right? Because they're temporary, right? How could you why would you why would you straighten the temporary teeth? But let's say, let's imagine, let's imagine that there was someone who was so vain that they even put braces on baby teeth. Let's imagine. Let's imagine that was true. But no one who would put braces on baby teeth would not put braces on permanent teeth. Even if you do care about the temporary, you'll never care about the temporary to the exclusion of the permanent. Even teeth are not permanent, right? But they're more permanent than the temporary. And here what the Yetzirah is telling us to do is to put braces on the baby teeth, but not to put braces on the permanent teeth. That's what it's telling us. And of course it's so illogical once you realize that. Prioritize the temporary world and ignore the spiritual, the permanent world. It doesn't make any sense. But we we ignore that. And here he says, and just reminding us, nothing that Akavi Manhel told us we didn't know. We knew everything that he told us. But he's just reminding us. And, and he says, dwell in it, consider it, confront it, visualize it. Make that thing that you know, make that actually influence your behavior. If you do that, you will not sin. I've uh, said a different uh, analogy in the past. I don't think I've shared this one. And that's the uh, time traveler argument. My time traveler argument is as follows. You know, if someone was able to invent a device to travel back in the past, what's well, the first thing you do is you open up a brokerage account and you start buying stocks. <laughs> Why? Because if you're guided by the foreknowledge of the future, then that's the profitable thing to do is that you know which companies are going to go up in value and you invest in those companies. And you know what you don't do? You don't buy Enron because you know that Enron's going down to zero. <laughs> you don't make an investment in something that's going down to zero. What's the Yitzhara telling us? Invest in your body to the exclusion of the future plans. Well, we know like once the day of death comes, we know that, okay, that's D-Day for, uh, that's Lehman Brothers, that's uh, Bear Stearns, that's Enron, that's a WorldCom. There is going to be some point in time where that's it. It worms and maggots, nothing, done, dust, that's it. And that is a very powerful, logical case. And I've said this before kind of in this way. Suppose someone is, you know what, they're dubious. I don't know, do I have a soul, do I not have a soul? Is there a spiritual world? Is there not a spiritual world? I don't know. I'm not convinced, right? Let's say you have that, that, that argument. I think there's still a logical case, even if someone is not convinced. They're not convinced. But what we know for sure is that we all know we're going to die, right? So it's almost like we're time travelers. We're time travelers because we, we, we do know the future. Everyone who's listening to this knows that they will die. Their body will stop working, put on the ground to be munched on by worms and maggots, right? So you're a time traveler. Because you are here from the from the future, because you know the future. Okay, so how are you going to make your investments? Like, how do we invest now? We have a brokerage account. How are we going to choose to make investments for the future? Well, we know for sure is that the body's going down to zero. The body's Enron. That we know for sure. We know that. Yet the Eitzara says, invest in Enron. Invest in Brer Stearns. And that's what he's telling us. And here, what is it? here, it's a logical argument. Even if you're not sure about the dividends of the soul, you, you don't know. But you are sure about one thing. Suppose, it's again, back to our example. You know Enron's going to zero. You don't know what's happening with the other stocks. But you know for sure that this is going down to zero. And therefore, it's logical to take even the chance of eternal dividends from the soul that should outweigh the assured crash of what the AIDS is peddling, what it's proposing of total investment into the world of, of the body. But it is interesting. Again, Akavi Bamahala is telling us things that we know already. We know it. Everything that he said, we know. But he's presenting to us in a way, in a formula, that it's a guaranteed antidote to sin. Look at the routines, you won't sin. But wait, I, I, I knew this information. I knew already. Everyone here knew these information, this information. So what, what's he, what's he, what's his insight? What's his novel idea? So my grandfather used to point out that it doesn't say 
no three things. It says, histakel b'shloshet dvarim. The word histakel, the histakel means to look or to visualize. And the idea being is that it's not about discovering information you didn't know. It's information you knew very well. But you have to create a confrontation with this information in the way that's going to inspire action. It has to be vivid. It has to have imagery to it in order for it to actually work. So it doesn't say, know that you're going to die. Everyone knows that. It's a theoretical abstraction that everyone knows, but it's not likely to inspire action. It says, worms and maggots. My goodness, isn't there a better way to remind me that I'm going to die? Why do you have to talk about the worms and maggots? It's, it's presenting something vivid, something that to awaken us, to, to make it real. My Rav used to say, he says, it doesn't say in the Talmud and Brachas, it doesn't say to think about that you're going to die. It says, remember the day of death. Well, what happens to the day of death? Maybe you're sick at the beginning of the day. You're very ill. Hopefully you'll be very old, surrounded by loved ones. We don't know how we're going to go, but we hope it's going to be in a good way. But what's going to happen? Bodies will stop, stop working. Maybe they'll bring in the doctor to just sign off on the papers and then they put you in the morgue and hopefully you'll have a, uh, a we'll all have a Jewish burial and be done according to halacha. But again, you, you visualize your body's now in the box. And maybe people are speaking about you. Hopefully they're saying good things. Hopefully there's a nice crowd. Again, this is a lot of details here. Okay, well now they're lowering the beer into the into the into the ground and they're putting putting dirt on top of it. That's what he's telling us to do. Everyone knows they're gonna die, but this is kind of taking that to a level where it's going to really inspire action. You know, there's a famous verse in Ecclesiastes chapter seven. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of of feasting, for it is the end of every man, and the living will take it to heart. What King Solomon is telling us here is that when you go to visit a house of mourning, you don't discover a hitherto unknown fact. Oh, now I know people die. No, you knew that already. But here you see it. There's some strong, palpable reminder of the fact that we are temporary. And when you realize that, it may have a sobering effect on the Yitzhahara. You'll be able to f- assess what the actual cost-benefit analysis is. What what are we really living for? It's insane to optimize and to solely focus on a world that we're going to lose. We're going to lose this world. But hopefully, we'll already have invested in the world that we're not going to lose in the world of the soul. And again, I think there's, there's, there's a powerful takeaway here that you don't need to rely on religiosity for this, for this tactic to work. It seems like even without really religiosity, without belief in a dogmatic idea that there is a spiritual world, there is an afterlife, even without that, there's a logical case here that Akavi Ben Mahalal is conveying that everyone knows this is true, or at least certainly the, the beginning, the origin of, of the body and the destiny of the body. Everyone knows that. Yet, we live as if that wasn't true. And that's because of the Yitzhara. Again, he creates that smoke smoke screen. But just focus on the facts. Separate what's true, what we know for sure, and what we're uncertain from, and we have a formula to avoid sinning. I want to point out, just to conclude, that this could have a and the opposite effect. This could backlash. How so? In Genesis, we read about Jacob and Esau. Jacob's making dinner. Esau's hungry. And the most lopsided transaction in history happens. Jacob is able to procure the firstborn right from Esau in exchange for a bowl of soup. How does... Esau justify his transaction. So he says, Hine anochi holech lamus. Behold, I am going to die. Why do I need this? It seems like it's the opposite. When Esau comes into contact with the, his mortality, he doesn't head in the way that a caveat seems to predict. He heads in the opposite direction. When someone like Esau was so consumed with pursuing physical pleasure, the idea 
of losing this world actually creates the opposite. Instead of saying, oh, what am I really living for? Let's live, let's try to invest in my spiritual side. It creates the opposite. It creates this idea that I have to have a frenzied rush to maximize what I have over here. I'm go- if I'm going to die, why do I need the spiritual thing? The bowl of soup is preferable. So maybe that's why we're also told that we have to remember that we're going to give a reckoning and an, account, an accounting before God. Meaning that we have to have a certain degree of, uh, of a spiritual baseline for this to work. If we're totally consumed with pursuit of physical pleasure, if that's the only thing, then it might actually have a reverse effect. That when we come into close confrontation with our mortality, Instead of saying, oh, let's invest in the spiritual world, it'll be the exact opposite. I got to maximize this world, the physical world, the world of my body before time runs out. So there, I think there is a certain, even though logically we know that his, his ideas are very sound, but there, there is a certain foundation. There's a certain baseline that is needed. We have to, again, dwell on the idea of, of, of the spiritual world, uh, the idea of giving an accounting and recting before God, the idea of that the Torah is making demands of us. Once we have that, it's likely, quite likely, maybe even guaranteed, that dwelling on our own mortality and on the shameful origins and destiny of our body, it will hopefully recalibrate our decisions and it's a guaranteed formula against sinning.